This is the story of one day in the life of the Countryside Education Trust. The day in question was Midsummer's Day 1997, and the location for our House in Time project was this area of ancient and ornamental woodland on the Bewley Estate in the New Forest. The aim of the day was to test a local theory which said that it is possible to build a cob house in a day and have smoke rising through the roof by sunset. So, welcome to Midsummer's Day in the year of our Lord, 1650. Dawn on the 21st of June, the longest day, and like ghosts from another age, they gather. A clearing in the ancient woodland of the New Forest, the site for an historical experiment never before attempted. According to folklore passed down through the centuries, a person who built a dwelling between sunrise and sunset on the same day with a fire burning in the hearth became the owner. While not strictly true in law, the difficulty of getting that person off the land once the house was built and occupied made it a popular way for peasants to lay claim to their own small piece of land. Today, the equivalent of a whole village has turned out to work together to build a house for the young couple who are to be married at sunset after the fire in the hearth has been lit. The workers have set out to prove that the house can be built in the time, just as it would have been in 1650, using only period tools, methods and equipment. The topsoil is dug away to provide a firm foundation and a key for the walls. In the 17th century, half of Britain's population were extremely poor, living on as little as six pounds a year, or they could have been bonded to the lord of the manor and received payment in kind, like rent or clothing. For them, the cheapest building material in the area in which they lived was the only option. Here, it was clob or mud, a mixture of clay, straw and water, now known as cob. The walls, which could not normally be built six feet high in a single day, just of mud and straw, could, however, be built if a layer of mud or reed was laid every four or five inches across the wall. This had several uses. It provided reinforcing to allow the wall to be built up squarely without any form of shuttering. It tied the corners together, and the layers of reed prevented the moisture in the cob from sinking to the bottom of the wall and causing its subsequent collapse. For this challenge, over 44 tons of clay were brought in, but generally it was dug from near the house, in a watercourse, so the resulting pit became a pond for water storage and wildlife. The straw was mixed with the clay as a binding agent to prevent the walls cracking open as they dried out. The builders, in their many practice sessions, developed a technique, as would have happened at the time, of mixing the straw by sprinkling it over the clay as it was placed into the wheelbarrows instead of mixing it on the ground. We put four inches of clay in and then a layer of straw and then four, about four inches of straw. It's not accurate, but uh, you have to just keep mixing it as you go. You've got to be very careful when you do this. You know, bend, bend the knees rather than bend the back over, otherwise we'll be dead. That's fun. The wheelbarrows are copies of an original dug up and dated from the time made of oak planks, with wheels made of elm hubs, oak spokes and ash naves, held together with an iron rim, which is heated in a fire to expand the metal, which is then knocked onto the wooden rim. It's then shrunk by dowsing with water to pull the parts of the wheel tightly together. Some of the tools are original. Most had to be made especially for the day, including the cob forks, paring tools and wall whackers. Cutting it down, trying to keep the actual wall firm, trying to keep it dry in. Oh, and also wet as well. It's got different consistencies of the uh, 
the clay, which makes it very difficult. The simplicity of the cob wall, though, meant much of the work was done with hands and feet. A stomper, a wall walker, to compact the clay to make the wall solid, and then come along and pat the sides and keep the width, and just actually trim it down if it starts to uh, come out of line. After more than three hours' labour, a 17th century breakfast of gruel. Then back to work. Every village would have had a blacksmith, sometimes two or more in the larger community. Making all the metalwork of the time, they were a common and central part of traditional life. Now we're making hinges for the doors, uh, the windows, uh, maybe a, a door knocker, door handle, whatever we've got time to produce. The fire here is, is brick and clay um, with a wood frame and uh, the bellows are uh, traditional blacksmith bellows and lots of pumping going on back today. Hinges now and then it's going to be decorative stuff, um, reed lamp holders which are a traditional type of uh, peasant candle um, with a, the holder reed with tallow on it to burn um, and then any other decorative bits we have time to do. The carpenters worked flat out assembling the roof A-frames and fixing them to the wall plates to form the two hip ends of the roof, which can then be lifted individually to allow the thatchers to start thatching while the rest of the walls are finished. I'm putting all the battens on, we're going to put the cross members on for the thatcher. And hopefully, Skipper, it'll all uh, stay together when we lift it up. It's all green wood, straight from the, it was all cut within the last week or two. These are, I mean, there's a bit of willow, this is mainly ash. Um, and we, we split these with wedges and goodness knows what just to make them. It's easier to cut, it's a bit softer, but nothing square. The jointing is interesting. I mean, you make the square end there, then the other end is... So it takes a long time to make the joints all up. The carpenters were also called on for running repairs, and the wall builders had to keep up the pace of their mud throwing and trampling. begins to take shape and provides a tremendous incentive for the builders to complete the wall. Glass was a luxury which would not have been found in this simple dwelling but could have been added later. The walls are leveled by eye and then checked by stretching tarred twine strings along the length of the wall. A makeshift plumb bob measure was also used. So what's happened in building up the wall it's pushed it two or three inches out of vertical sideways. So what the chopping gadgets were for, uh, for cutting the walls back square again, so the walls are actually vertical. If it sort of continues on going out, it would eventually fall over, you know, so the problem is to keep it so it goes up square. of the clearing, preparations are underway to feed the workers. Everybody brought something, and a team of women cooked on fires in the open air. Well, you've got pramathy, which is a mixture of pulses, beans, grass seeds, and any other seed that they can find in the field. 
that is cooked, it's served um, as a complement to a meal. Sometimes if you're really hard up, it's served actually as a meal. Uh, with it we've got hodgepodge. Uh, we had um, 20 rabbits this morning, fresh caught, and those are in the pot now, boiling away merrily. We've also got cheese, we've got homemade butter, uh, there's eggs there, hard boiled eggs, and there's uh, various small ales and juices for them to drink. Lift it over the stump, we've got a stump in the way. Swing it round through 90 degrees so it's facing the right way. Move it down to the end of the building, put it down, everybody have a rest, then have a lift and put it on. The problem of how to get the roof in place had concerned the planners of this challenge. Their 17th century counterparts would have faced the same difficulties. The answer was a series of poles tied to the hip ends at an angle so that enough men could position themselves around it to lift it onto the walls without the walls getting in the way. Some thought the roof sections would be too heavy to lift, but it worked like a dream. Some final alignments using sticks and tarred twine and the poles are removed. The mud is packed under and around the wall plates, which also stops many of the drafts, and 15-inch wooden pegs are driven through holes in the wall plates to fix them to the wall. For the builders, the work just about done. Midday, now known as lunch, and a chance to rest. I absolutely need it. I am starving and I'm tired. The first hip end in place and the thatchers can start work. The A-frames for the middle section are lifted onto the wall before the second hip end is moved into place. The carrying poles are attached to the remaining hip end with tarred twine ready to be lifted into position. Again there are plenty of willing helpers. Doubts about whether the hip ends would stay together are quickly dispelled. The ash roofing poles, freshly cut from local woodland, have caused some problems as they split easily. As all the joints are different, the wall plates and poles are marked so that they're easily joined together on the roof. The traditional ladders needed were made from freshly cut large poles sawn in half with ash cleft rungs turned on the ends fitted into the holes in the sides and held together with wooden wedges driven into the ends. The hazel battens are put in place and held with nails to link the three sections of the roof together. The excess is broken off. A last check to make sure the roof trusses are in line. The wooden pegs holding the structure as well as any modern technique. Finally, the thatching could begin in earnest. A team of eight thatchers work flat out using water reed cut from the river estuaries nearby for the roof and organically grown straw for the ridge, cut and grown as it would have been 350 years ago. The ridge should last up to 30 years, providing the ridge is replaced every 10 years or so. The ridge is the weakest part. If this deteriorates, the water can penetrate the coat of thatch rather than just running off it. We always start from the bottom and we're tying this on the old fashioned method with tarred twine. Um, it's a good method, it's tried and tested, it does work, uh, but normally modern standards we would use iron crooks or even screw it on. In 1650, the thatch would have been full of weeds and other grasses, as the only form of weed control was by hand. Many other materials would have been used for thatching such as heather, gorse, bracken and sedge grass, flax, bulrush, broom, wheat, rye, barley and oats. <laughs> 
whatever was locally available. It's said that a squatter would stand at the doorway of the house and throw a stone to mark the perimeter of their property, although this would depend on where it had been built. On common land, the landowners would have less of a chance to dispute their claim. The peasants who lived in this sort of cob house were largely self-sufficient, relying on their livestock and produce, but many were dependent on the common land for grazing. As cows were expensive, goats were more common, and their milk was used for butter and cheese, while the young could be sold at market. <laughs> Inside the house, the finishing touches, shutters to keep out the wind and rain, fastened with the iron catches made by the blacksmith. The door is fitted, the hinges and catch having been made on site. The house really now seems just about complete once the door is hung. Conditions for those who would have lived here were very basic. There were no luxuries, the walls left uncovered. A simple mud slurry worked by hand into the surface to give a smooth finish and coated with boiled linseed oil. The main divisions would be um, the sleeping area, there would be um, a living area, and you would have perhaps a cattle area as well, where they would keep perhaps sheep or goats even inside. Um, it would be quite, quite common to have uh, chicken around, uh, in and out, um, quite Often they would have pigs in here as well, so it was quite a, a big family thing. Sometimes they would have a bed, sometimes they would just roll up on the floor. Uh, a bed was um, a very popular wedding present, which was handed down from father to son. Um, if they were lucky enough to have a wedding present given them, then they would use it. If not, they would make a, a pellet up which would be um, rough wood bound together with hide and then they would sleep on that. But more often than not, the poorer people would sleep direct onto the floor. The floor has a layer of clay smoothed over and reed or straw laid on top to help stop the damp and to give some comfort. When soiled, it can be easily changed. The house complete, the volunteers christen or hansel the cottage by dancing on the wet clay floor. This process is called adorbing, and in this way the people make a frolic of what is a dirty or disagreeable job. Life at this time was hard, as average life expectancy was only 32 years, with a quarter of all children dying before the age of five, and another quarter before they reached 25. This, quite honestly, is rather large for a family. Um, this one would be more like a, a farmhouse size and it would be nothing to have 10 or 12 children there because the more children you had, the better likelihood you had of being looked after in your um, old age. For more sleeping accommodation, timber boards can be added to a section of the rafters to form a platform. It could be quite warm and cosy, but a little smoky at times. They would all be here and uh, it would just become one vast dormitory night times. We lived, it, died and did everything else in this room. All the cooking is done on an open fire, even inside. A hearth is laid on the floor as there's no chimney. The smoke escapes through the roof vents, and a chimney can always be added later. To claim squatters' rights, the house has to be completed in a day. A fire has to be lit and smoke seen coming through the smoke holes before sunset. now have their house and can start their new life thanks to their neighbours. Such was community life in the 17th century. Those villagers who gathered here this morning shortly after sunrise have laboured hard all day to build this house which now has walls, a roof, thatch and a fire alight in the grate. And all of these works completed 
before sunset on this same day. Jacob may now take Catherine as his bride and dwell in this place. Jacob, dost thou wish to have this woman as your wife? Yea. And Catherine, will you serve, love, honour and obey this man as your husband? Yes. May God bless you both. The experiment had worked, completed within the hours of daylight, about 16 hours and 40 minutes, with smoke rising just before sunset. Just as their ancestors had done before them, these latter-day peasants faced the ancient challenge and built a house in time. This project succeeded beyond our wildest dream. But of course, to be realistic, it couldn't really happen in a single day. Before we even began, months of research were required and a whole lot of preparations had to be made. For example, we had to get the tools made. We needed to run rehearsal weekends with our volunteers on a different site to learn and test the building techniques. I had to make all the costumes. I had to research food for the day. And all that preparation was carried out before a single turf was moved on the site. From that time, we've managed to add drainage appropriate to the period to ensure that our new house stands for at least another hundred years. And of course, since then, it's been achieving its main purpose, with young people coming here every week to find out what life was really like here in the New Forest in the 17th century.